a lot of philosophy is like trying to distinguish whether the thing you're pissed off about is like the dove being stupidly infuriated at the air for like slumming it down or the fly being properly infuriated at the bottle for keeping it in. And I think we look around at the various constraints we operate under and it's just very hard to tell which of them are actually making the operation possible in the first place and which of them are actually getting in the way. Hello, my geeselings. It is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart, here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, number 77. And this episode is with Steve Yablo, who is David W. Skinner, professor of philosophy at MIT. And parenthetically, David W. Skinner, professor, is pretty much the coolest uh, professor uh, title I've, I've encountered thus far. It might even be cooler if it were just Skinner, professor of philosophy, uh, but David W. Skinner is pretty cool as well. So Steve works in metaphysics, the philosophy of math, the philosophy of mind, and the philosophy of language. But his work, he's, he's really a, a jack of all trades. His work extends to various other corners of philosophy. He gives lots of presentations and papers on sort of one-off-y things. And though this episode isn't a formal academic presentation, the content of our, of our discussion does not fall into those four categories I mentioned at the outset of my introduction. So first, we discuss defining ph philosophy, the nature of philosophy. And this begins with Karl Popper's demarcation problem for the philosophy of science, which is basically how we, how we ought to separate science from everything else. And even though I recorded this conversation chronologically prior to episode 73 with Craig Callender, perhaps 72, let's find out. Yeah, 73 with Craig Callender. That one was released before this for logistical reasons. And we also talk a bit about this Paparian problem. But there is a very nice article about the demarcation problem called Science and Pseudoscience on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy that you might want to check out. And then the other thing we discussed that doesn't fall into philosophy of math, mind, language, or metaphysics, though maybe you would want to classify it as philosophy of language, is we talk about jokes, uh, humor, jokes, and philosophy. And maybe I should add right now that Steve has a really great, charming, idiosyncratic sense of humor that it took me a while to get. And I think my sense of humor took Steve a while to get as well. So this episode is particularly funny and maybe meta as we really stumble over one another, misunderstanding each other's jokes. So at first, when I had no idea what was going on, uh, I said, Oh, I'll, I'll cut this joke out. This is a bad joke. Or maybe I said that once or twice. Uh, but we kept going back and forth between uh, back and forth in time during the episode, addressing our jokes and our misunderstandings of one another's jokes. So I decided to just uh, leave all of those things in. Anyway, we talk about Kant because uh, Kant apparently had some had some jokes that weren't so good. Well, I thought they were good. Uh, Steve wasn't as impressed as I was, but we talk about jokes and philosophy. And then sandwiched in the middle is some real metaphysics and philosophy of language. And we talk about negative existential statements or so, so sentences or statements in the form such and such or so-and-so does not exist or statements that just reference objects that don't exist. So the, the real, Canon canonical example is Sherlock Holmes. We seem to be able to predicate things of Sherlock Holmes, such as his address or uh, that he, he likes to smoke a pipe, or maybe that's his, his buddy that smokes the pipe. But anyway, he doesn't exist. So we seem to be predicating something of something that doesn't exist. Or when we say the such and such does not exist, we are really ref we're referring 
saying something about something that does not exist. And this just poses semantic problems for the philosophy of language. So we discussed that. And you should check out Steve's website, which is sjablo.com and Steve's latest book, Aboutness, which develops a theory of subject matter and its role in meaning. You should also leave as many likes as you can on this episode, uh, comments, maybe not as many comments as you can. Uh, I, I'm aware that you can only leave one like, but wouldn't it be great if you could leave more? Uh, subscribe, all those sorts of things. Check out the Twitch and YouTube channel, Robinson Eats. And without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Steve. In one of my early interviews, I was talking to a philosopher of physics, and this was before I had really any experience doing this. And my first question right off the bat was, what is physics? And that really caught him off guard and we ended up having to start over <laughs> since it was yeah. such a big question. But at this point, I oh, no I've problem. A... I can tell you what physics is. <laughs> well, that luckily, I mean, that's not where I'm going at this point. But um, at, so I've had a number of conversations since then, though, uh, well, I mean, about like, what is mathematics? What is physics? What is metaphysics? And I'd actually really like to talk about what philosophy is with you to start off. And maybe since I know you've been writing about the connection recently, maybe we could start with the demarcation problem as it applies to science and particularly with Karl Popper's views. So what was he concerned with? Um, yeah, I, so I'm totally not an expert on this. I, I just kind of leapfrogged off it for a certain purpose in that paper. But, but um, you know, he wanted to know what made science special and um, and he proposed that, and he, he wanted to distinguish it from, he had a strange list of things that weren't science. Yeah, I psychoanalysis was on that list. Psychoanalysis was on it, yeah. Mm -hmm. First I heard that wasn't science. But um, I guess it was in the air. He was in Vienna at the time. Um, but yeah, so he on the one hand, didn't really think that science was the kind of thing you could get much empirical confirmation for. So that put him in a special position as far as demarcating uh, science. But he did think that scientific theories were the kinds of things that you could falsify. And so he came up with this theory that what makes science, you can't falsify sort of a psychoanalytic diagnosis, there's always kind of room to scramble and try to save the diagnosis, but you can falsify scientific theory, he said. And I've never really totally understood how he could say that. There's an obvious like complaint, which he must have known about, and I'm sure he had an answer to, which is that, um, I mean, that that has the chance of being true if scientific theories are like all of universal generalization form, like, you know, I don't know, all swans are white. You find the first black swan that falsifies it. Um, but scientific theories and claims can have more complicated logical form than that. Here's my logical training coming in. Sometimes they can have a universal quantifier followed by an existential quantifier. And so suppose I said, you know, every sw swan has at least one sister. Uh, well, that's going to be harder to falsify. You can find the swan that allegedly doesn't have a sister, but the sister could be anywhere in the universe potentially. And so you wind up having to verify a universal claim, which is, which is what Popper was trying to avoid with his criterion. Right. Now, there's no way in the world he didn't know about that. And someday I'll try to figure out what he said about it. But that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how uh, does this, at least at first blush, relate to 
the demarcation problem for philosophy. So distinguishing what philosophy is from everything else. Yeah, so the thought was that a better approach than Popper's, at least in the case of science, is to um, ask what the, the, say, a given scientific theory is about. There are certain kinds of scientifically tractable subject matters where a subject matter is given, it's basically an aspect of the world that you're trying to get right. It's sort of formally represented as an equivalence relation or maybe something looser than an equivalence relation on possible uh, worlds. And so you might think that sort of biology is about a subject ma matter where worlds are equivalent. And then, you know, I wouldn't know how to state it very precisely, but where they're, um, you know, similar in the way organisms come into being or the way that organisms evolve. I guess it's part of this that as sciences evolve, they get to, their subject matters evolve too. You learn more about what a theory is about as the theory progresses. And so you wouldn't have necessarily known when you were starting to do chemistry that it was going to depend so much on stuff about the structure of, of the atom. You might not even have known much about the structure of the atom at that point. Um, anyway, so the thought is that um, scientific, scientific theories can be um, demarcated sort of at least more feasibly than Popper, Popper's approach. Um, would be an approach that said, well, you find a tractable subject matter, a subject matter such that you can get a good theory of how matters stand in the world where that subject matter is concerned. A good theory being one that where like a small number of principles goes a long way towards explaining where which cell of that subject matter our world uh, is in. Yeah. So j just to make sure that I'm following so we we might distinguish then uh psychology and chemistry based on the subject matter they're attending to yeah okay so so one one immediate question i would have then is if he didn't want to consider psychoanalysis say a science and again granted that you're not a popperian expert and this wasn't popper's view uh, but if we just want to grant for the sake of argument that psychoanalysis isn't a science, it yeah. seems like it's in the business of describing the same sorts of phenomena that psychology is. Uh, I, I mean, I guess it is also a branch of psychology, but we can maybe neglect that for the moment now. Then wouldn't it seem like they should be, I mean, like this is a counterexample to our ability to distinguish theories based on the subject matter they attend to? Yeah, so I didn't say that any subject matter is a fit subject matter for a science. I use this phrase tractable okay. subject matter and sort of a tractable subject matter. Again, this wouldn't be easy to explain either, but I was thinking that there's sort of um, a favorable ratio of theoretical assumptions to what you can sort of explain about our world's the state of play in our world where that subject matter is is concerned and the thought would be uh you know you can maybe do that pretty well uh for some branch or better for some branches of psychology than for than for psychoanalysis so it might be hard for instance to explain say the preponderance of id affects superego versus superego and ego effects on behavior in our world compared to other worlds. I mean, you most basically need Freud to tell you which was taking the lead, but it, it maybe is more possible to explain when, you know, the, you know, the relative influence of various psychological, you know, attested psychological conditions, or if not, then psychology wouldn't be a science. I mean, 
I, I let me rush in to say I put this stuff in to the paper you're talking about more as sort of an on ramp to some other right, stuff. Right, right. So I don't really have yeah. like huge numbers of positive views about it. But but the idea yeah. is that there's you know like so Lewis when he's talking about um, what makes something a law of nature talks about this trade off when you're trying to codify all the facts of a world between strength. Uh, and simplicity and simplicity is like small. You, you want to have relatively few basic assumptions and strength is you want to sort of uh, be able to predict a lot of facts. And I kind of had the same sort of thing in, in mind. So attractable subject matter is one that sort of permits theoretical treatment with a good ratio with, with a lot of strength and simplicity. Yeah. Okay. And okay. Yeah. Totally understanding. I, that I this was just an on ramp into yeah, yeah, yeah. the discussion yeah. of philosophy. So yeah. does this on ramp and then I quickly take an off ramp. So there's like virtually no time in that paper where I'm like at the, at the peak. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, but moving though into philosophy. So is the idea that, at first blush, we might demarcate philosophy based on the subject matters it attends to, such as, I mean, like philosophy is the field that studies metaphysics, epistemology, uh, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was the thought. Um, and there may be something kind of artificial about the notion of subject matter that that I was using, where it's sort of like a way of partitioning worlds with respect to how they stand in a certain, what they're like in certain respects. But I guess one, one way of putting the worry is that, um, I mean, suppose we're talking about uh, ethics, um, you know, different, ethical theories propose different answers to the question, you know, what should be done in a world that's naturalistically like this one. And so, and so it seems like um, they're saying for, so for, for different of those answers to be correct, it seems like there'd have to be a world like ours in naturalistic respects where, um, you know, corporal punishment is sometimes permissible and worlds just naturalistically just like ours where it isn't sometimes permissible but both ethical camps probably agree that there can't be both of those worlds because the normative facts supervene or are thought to supervene on the naturalistic facts not everybody believes that but at least it's a it's a worry that that you have if you're looking for sort of a neutral statement of how to state the subject of, 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 of uh, what the subject matter of ethics might be, it can't really be an equivalence relation on worlds where worlds are equivalent if they're the same in normative respects, because that's going to disallow the possibility of disagreement about of the kind that I just mentioned, where there's normative differences, but no underlying naturalistic differences. Yeah. And just to clarify, when you say that two worlds agree on the naturalistic facts, you mean they, they have the same physical facts? Yeah. Okay. So what then does this, I mean, where then did the, does the sequence of on and off ramps uh, generally lead you to conclude uh, about what philosophy is? Well, so I guess the thought winds up being that um, if subject matter, if the notion of subject matter is going to play any role in the characterization of what philosophy is, it's not going to be by um, providing a thing we can identify as the distinctive subject matter of philosophy. Maybe there's other another way of conceiving of subject matter where it can play that role, but at least the way I'm thinking of subject matter, it can't easily do that. So then I suggest something totally different, which is that 
think of it kind of the think of the nature of philosophical problems. And so I want to say that at least a lot of the deeper philosophical problems come from our having landed ourselves thinking about subject matters that um, get us in trouble. And one way into it is to think about, what I already mentioned I, uh, briefly, like the paradox of inquiry, that it seems like be, before you can get inquiry going, you have to have some idea of what you're inquiring into, but it's hard to know before inquiry uh, uh, progresses exactly what shape that intended object should should take. And so there's this sort of interplay between inquiry and what it's inquiry into. You know, the Greeks, when they looked at stars, thought they were trying to figure out something about apertures in the dome right, right. of heaven. Uh, and we don't think that anymore. So mm -hmm. th there's that sort of, con there's, there's a kind of like constructive feedback loop whereby finding things out uh, helps you update your views about what you're finding things out about. But you might think, well, very early on in the progress, in the process before any theories really get going, you have, you need some fairly basic, relatively sort of presuppositionless parts of inquiry. And I was thinking that philosophy, at least in the first instance, was like that, which le leads to a certain kind of tragic predicament whereby you kind of um, start inquiring into subject matters that turn out not really to bear scrutiny, but it's then it's too late when you realize that because to say, well, let's just abandon that is kind of to change the subject. And so the, the examples I gave of how this could happen is, um, well, one is like the way in which sort of common sense inquiry about color or about lots of sort of common sense categories that are supposed to be able to be judged on an observational basis um, gets us into Sorites paradoxes. So you want to be able to say that whether something is red can be judged on the basis of casual observation, but it seems to follow from that, that if two things sort of look the same chromatically, then they're the same in color, but that gives you the crucial premise of a Sorites paradox, because you can have a sort of a string of objects leading from like a paradigmatically red one to a paradigmatically pink one and uh, adjacent objects in the sequence look exact or observationally indistinguishable. So mm -hmm. it seems like you've got to say of any adjacent pair that the one's red if and only if the other's red. And then that leads you by logic to the conclusion that even the pink one is red. And, and it seems like Part of what makes the Sorites, that kind of Sorites paradox kind of gripping is it's it's really part of what you're talking about, namely sort of observational color that that you can't distinguish in color between things that no matter how, how hard you stare at them look the same. And you, of course, you could make up a new subject matter of like deep or hidden color. And some people kind of would suggest that they say, oh, we're really trying to get at spectral reflectance profiles and you can't always tell the difference between those just by a casual look under ordinary lighting conditions. You really have to vary the light a lot to, um, and then certain differences sort of turn up. But I take it we don't ordinarily think that when we're talking about what's red, we're talking about a property that you need to look at a thing under all possible lighting conditions before you can tell right. whether it's red. Yeah. Hmm. And so then you get into this kind of like predicament where if you don't want to change the sub, you, you, you get a paradoxical result if you don't, uh, if you stick to the going subject matter, but if you, um, if you, um, 
So to get out of that paradoxical predicament, you have to change the subject matter, but then it seems like, well, that's not interesting. So it's like if someone said, you know, should I, you know, suppose you're in a Sophie's Choice situation where you've got to give up one of your children to the Nazis and, 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 and there's no good answer to the question. And someone says, well, let me substitute a different question, you know, what would lead to the greatest overall pleasure? And you kind of say, well, yeah, you could substitute that. And supposing you could answer that, I mean, that would give you an answerable question, but it wasn't really the question we started with. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm I'm hearing a, a few things. One that well, one thing Only that occurred. A few? I was trying to <laughs> I was trying to flood the zone. Yeah, well, no, it was flooded. So maybe maybe a few was an understatement. But uh, so one thing that occurs to me is that one prob one problem with trying to demarcate philosophy based on subject matter is that, uh, and I don't you didn't really mention this, but I mean any subject can I don't think we can really subject we can really exclude any subject from philosophical inquiry. And then another problem that you were pointing to is that the, in asking a certain question, like asking about the stars, for instance, uh, the subject matter, the object of our inquiry is constantly changing. And then another issue that occurs is that hmm, maybe philosophical inquiry can also expand and contract it can be very narrow and then it can also become extremely general so the entire universe is the subject of of some philosophical investigations so does all of this point to maybe philosophy being more of a family of methodologies or an attitude uh where where does this sort of slipperiness of material get us in the end when trying to demarcate philosophy? Well, I guess the first thing is I'm not sure I, I agree that any subject matter is the kind of thing that could be taken up by philosophers. I mean, maybe okay. that's maybe a different issue from the issue of whether for every going theory X, there's such a thing as philosophy of X. Or even for every, you know, I wouldn't say like there's a philosophy of like what to do on Tuesdays. Um, yeah, it's interesting you know. that there, I mean, philosophers' opinions disagree on this. I interviewed uh, Peter Adamson uh, a few months ago, and he, I think the example he used was he's, he thought that, or I guess he was just musing, but he was like, Maybe you can philosophize about anything. Maybe there's a philosophy of cheese. So it's interesting that something so basic as this possibility that you can philosophize about anything is a, something that professional philosophers will disagree on. That I mean, that in itself suggests that the the material of philosophy or the object of philosophy is quite slippery. Yeah. No. 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 No doubt it is. Um, I mean, maybe we could distinguish like what is a suitable question for philosophers to worry about from what could a highly trained philosopher find something to pick at, you know, and no doubt, you know, if philosophers stuck on a desert island, they might well like start getting interested in what sand really is and so on and so forth. But uh -huh. that isn't to say that there aren't, you know, differences between the, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the amenability of this or that question to full, you know, mm -hmm. philosophical study. Um, so, um, yeah, just like, you know, you could make, a joke about just about anything. You could make a joke about the Holocaust. That isn't to say that. Uh, that isn't to say that that uh, some areas aren't more sort of ripe for like humorous treatment than others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, but but I guess what I, what I want to say is this is and this is maybe this is maybe like peculiar to me, but. And, but 
there's there's a certain kind of philosophy that I was taught in graduate school at Berkeley after I switched from logic and methodology that was that emphasized sort of philosophical predicaments in certain ways that you could kind of get pinned philosophically. And 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 so I used like so I, I said I was trying to like categor I mean demarcate um um kind of uh this th- th- this this sort of uh getting pinned sort of philosophy which is sort of like perennial problems that you can never get rid of because they keep getting thrown back at you by what the very nature of what you're talking about. And that that's what I was trying to oh, So the Sorites was one example. Well, Liar paradox. Been around another... since like Eubulides. Sorry? Yeah. The, yeah. yeah Eubulides, the, the, yeah. Um, the, the liar paradox. Mm-hmm. Um, semantic paradoxes generally. I mean, so you might think, look, it's in the very nature of, of, of truth talk that these, these T by conditionals have to hold, you're really talking about something, be, you know, T phi, if and only if phi, it's true that snow is white, if and only if snow is white, you've, you've, you've switched to another topic if you are preparing to give some of those up. Um, I gave the example of like, well, suppose, you know, people get convinced of Kripke's theory of truth where, you know, the, the, liar paradox doesn't really arise. You just say it's it's neither true nor false, or it's not sort of the kind of thing that can be evaluated at all. And I say, well, you can consider the possibility of like children being raised on a Kripke and kibbutz where they're taught Kripke's theory. They're never like taught about truth the way we we understand it. And if and if you say, well, take this liar sentence. Um, it's neither true nor false, right? So, so then in particular, it's not true, but that's what it it says, and so shouldn't we regard it as true? Because what you yourself are saying about it seems to make a case for its being true. And they say, "What? What are you talking about? It's a gap. To call a gap true is itself neither true nor false." And I guess we're inclined to think, "Boy, you're really not." not getting it you know you 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 can say that if you want but that's just to say that you've like set up shop on a neighboring island where the thing we were interested in isn't doesn't really doesn't really exist you know so um so i like the idea that that semantic paradoxes are a little bit like moral dilemmas in the sense that that um it lies in the very You know, you could suppose you make like two promises to like two friends. Maybe they're unequally stringent and it turns out you can't you can't meet them both. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not a good answer to say, well, look, you know, this friend's in the hospital and we just agreed that we would go to the beach. And so I got to keep the promise to the hospital friend that I'd come when she needed to, you know, get her treatment. Um, just as we don't think it's a good answer to that, I mean, a lot of people do say this, that, well, the, the less stringent promise is just sort of waived or it's vacated or it's canceled. We say, no, you still owe your friend an apology for not being able to keep that promise. And it's sort of some, there's something, something bad that you should feel regret about that you weren't able to keep the promise that we can agree maybe shouldn't have been kept. I feel the same way about about the semantic paradoxes, the certain things that we can agree that you can't ultimately say, certain kind of ideals you can't ultimately live up to, but you should feel bad about it. The fact that you can't do something. Maybe this is an area where, where um, I guess I'm inclined to think odd implies can, maybe has its limits, yeah. Well, uh, so finishing up, though, with this demarcation uh, as regards philosophy and maybe just thinking about what philosophy is, two people I've talked to recently that had some general thoughts, not rigorous at all, about what philosophy is 
are David Papineau and Heim Gaifman. And David Papineau just said that like science, philosophy is in the business of constructing good, true synthetic theories about the world. And then Heim Gaifman's thought was that philosophy is just about uh, providing insight into questions, uh, into deep questions. And do you have like a, a one sentence or two sentence thought on what philosophy is then? Well, I'd be a lot closer to Geifman's position, I guess, than to uh, David Papineau's, if that's if that's my my choice. Um, I think, yeah, I think if philosophy, at least the you know, there's lots of parts of philosophy, and some of them are, I agree, are like trying to come up with sort of constructive theories of things that are maybe under theorized by 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 science but the kind that interests me is the kind where you get trapped and there are these deep questions that it's not so we i mean there are you know sometimes you know Wittgenstein and philosophers used to say that you know philosophy is you know a series of unforced errors yeah. and i'm attracted to the view that there are some unforced errors i mean i think some of the aspects of the of the mind body problem are unforced errors but there's a lot of forced errors too. And I think this, what Geifman said about insight into deep questions can consist in trying to figure out exactly how the, the error is forced. The questions have presuppositions sometimes and the presuppositions are false. It'd be one thing if you just like, so if a philosophical problem had the, had the form of, um, um, how wise is the king of France, then it would be enough to say, dumb question, there is no king of France. Uh -huh. But if it has the form of like, well, what what should we do? Uh, it's not so easy to say, dumb question, there's nothing we should do. Or who taught you that life would be that easy? Well, nobody taught me that, but there's still the question of how to, how to live. And so anyway, I think, Insight into deep, deep questions with the cut with the um, addendum that that insight can sometimes take the form of, you know, as Williamson often puts it, there's no substitute for judgment. There's no like principled answer you can give, but to say, you know, use everything your mama taught you to try to figure mm -hmm. these things out and sometimes throw your hands up and say, you're not going to be able to resolve this to everyone's satisfaction yeah i recently did an episode with uh Graham, graham graham priest uh oh, yeah. the, the metaphysics of nothingness so well that, oh, yeah. that was a couple of months ago but you know uh you, i'm sure you know graham's a nunist so he believes that non-existent objects are i mean naturally they do, they don't exist but they are right. in the yeah. sense that they're in our domain of quantification so yeah so like while sherlock holmes doesn't exist spatio-temporally uh, we can still refer to him so in that sense he is but yeah but you've been writing and, and thinking about these non-existence claims lately and from a from a different perspective from grams so i mean before we talk about how you might treat them I, I'm, what are some of the reasons that are interesting to you? I'm guessing that since you mentioned this earlier, it has something to do with I don't, getting pinned down or that there are problems that we've been dealing with for quite some time. I mean, since the sophist, at least. I mean, Plato or even Gorgias was talking about this. So I didn't even know that. That's, yeah. so that's the why then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you answered your own question. Um, yeah, I mean, it. it, it seems... Yeah, there's just something sort of deeply mysterious and you kind of you kind of don't expect there to ever be like a clear completely satisfactory answer to how it's possible to identify a thing as the one you want to deny the existence of without at the same time kind of giving it a certain amount of credit that's there to be identified in some sense, mm -hmm. uh, which seems like it's tantamount to giving it credit for existing. Although, I mean, of course, there's other options like give it, 
giving it credit for being in some in some lesser sense. So it just sort of seems like it's like one of those it's like one of those cases where you seem to be cutting off the branch that you're sitting on when you make certain kinds of claim. And I like that. I like that kind of that kind of uh, scenario where there's an expressive need where that intuitively is easily filled by a certain sort of sentence, but our best theoretical understanding of that, of what goes on in the semantics of that sentence sort of prevents it from filling that, makes it hard to see how it could fill that expressive need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, in the paper I'm thinking of, you mention three problems uh, that come about when thinking about or dealing with these non-existence claims. And they're the problems of aboutness, indirection, and equivocation. Could you uh, tell me what, what these three problems are before we start thinking about how they might be addressed? Yeah. Um, so the aboutness problem is like when I say uh, Falstaff doesn't exist or Vulcan doesn't exist, um, what am I talking about? It seems like I'm attributing a property to something. It seems like there's a subject matter to my claim. And um, if indeed there is no such thing as Falstaff, no such thing as Vulcan, then I can't point to that entity as what I'm what I'm talking about. Is and so the problem it's not I'm talking about anything. Sorry. Yeah. Is that the problem of aboutness? That's the problem of okay. of aboutness. I mean, a version of it which is a bit more which which comes a little bit later in the in the dialectic is um it seems like I'm talking about different things when I say that Vulcan doesn't exist um versus saying that Falstaff doesn't exist um and the fact that we, it was hard to come up with even one thing <laughs> for the sentences to be about uh makes it, you know, additionally embarrassing that it seems like we need two, at least two things. Mm -hmm. And no doubt, there are many other things that don't exist, which is an, uh, like a, a very tempting thing to, uh, to say. Yeah, and Graham, of course, has no, no problem dealing with it when you use yeah. the word are in that sense. And it yeah. is, I mean, at least facially, a very pleasing sort of response. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I I agree that these are things that we want to say, and and the the question is really kind of what is the tone of voice in which we want to say them. Um, I mean, look, I mean to to use to go back to the King of France example. If I was to give you a list of the people I didn't have breakfast with, I could give. Uh, not only um, Graham, I could give Graham Priest, and I could give Saul Kripke, who recently died, mm -hmm. and I could give Falstaff, who never existed. Seems perfectly true to say I didn't have breakfast with Falstaff. And the question is just sort of how does it achieve that? Yeah. That status. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about. Um, or at least yeah. we've labeled the aboutness problem. Then there's the indirection and the equivocation. All right. So the indirection problem is, so you got to find a subject matter for say false theft doesn't exist. And the history of this, uh, you know, of theorizing about negative existentials consists in like a series of different things that have been nominated as what the, those sentences could be about. So there's like, your idea of Falstaff, or Frege says the concept of Falstaff, or maybe even the sense of the word Falstaff. Um, um, 
Walton suggests, a certain kind of referring attempt, the kind that's sort of put on display when I use the word Falstaff, the kind that I pretend to engage in when I use the word Falstaff. And, um, and so we'll say we're talking, or the property of being Falstaff, or um, these are all things that have been sort of, uh, so, or the word Falstaff. These things have all been sort of suggested as the real topic yeah. of these sorts of claims. And so the problem of indirection is, that's the second problem. It doesn't really seem to be what we're talking about when we say that false theft doesn't exist. We don't seem to right. be talking about a name or a referring attempt or it's a, or the concept or anything like that. Yeah. Right. And then the problem of um, equivocation is that suppose that you and I disagree about whether Venus uh, exists. Normally, it seems like for genuine disagreement, I actually disagree with this, but I'll just sort of say it. Uh, there has to be a single proposition whose truth would be required for my side of the disagreement to, to win or to be vindicated and whose falsity would go with your side of the disagreement being vindicated. Or at least there has to be a proposition whose truth value we're disagreeing about. Whereas in the case of Vulcan exists, suppose I believe in Vulcan and you don't believe in Vulcan. If you're right, if Vulcan doesn't exist, then what vindicates your position is that maybe a certain name doesn't refer. But what vindicates my position, if there really is a Vulcan, is the singular proposition that has Vulcan in the first position and existence in the second position. And so it sort of seems like we're talking past each other because the proposition that you expect to hold is not the proposition that I expect to fail. And the proposition that I expect to hold is not the proposition you expect to fail. You don't even think there is any such proposition as the one that I expect to, to hold. So it's a little bit difficult to see what we're disagreeing about. Mm -hmm. hmm. And so that's what I call the, the problem of, of equivocation. I mean, this is really a quite general problem that really applies not just to existence, but, for example, to identity claims. So if I think Hesperus is phosphorus and you think Hesperus isn't phosphorus, um, or if I think Eminem is Marshall Mathers and and you think Eminem isn't Marshall Mathers, then um, um, the proposition that I think vindicates me is, you know, X equals X because where the first X is M and M, the second X is Marshall Mathers, but they're the same person. Whereas the proposition that you think vindicates you has an X and a Y and an identity sign, a non-identity sign, if you like, um, where X and Y are distinct items. So there isn't, doesn't seem to be any single proposition that we're disagreeing about. And I think this happens in lots of cases. Suppose we disagree yeah. about whether like there's something under the under the table and I think it's a dog and you think it's a wolf. Well, if I'm right, then 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 the thing under the table is a dog. If you're right, the thing under the table is a wolf. But then it isn't then when I say that's a dog and you say that's a wolf, it isn't really we're not really talking about the same thing in a certain sense. Right. Because if you're right the X can't be both a dog and a wolf. There's no single X that has the potential to be both a dog uh, and, a, and a wolf. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you're using the, the m and example because I wouldn't have understood otherwise. <laughs> oh. My understanding is that you prefer a sort of uh, a pretense account or a pretense approach to the negative existential claims. So how does uh, Kendall Walton purport to account for, for the, the three problems we just mentioned with uh, a pretense account? Yeah. So Ken Walton and, and David Hills and Crystal Lawler and me and my wife Sally and a bunch of other people in my universe all used to be at Ann Arbor, Michigan in the, in the 1980s and early nineties. And, um, and, uh, we used to talk a lot about 
pretense and pretense theoretic approaches to philosophy of language. And what makes this kind of case interesting is that normally when people try to bring pretense to bear semantically, they're, they're analyzing the relevant sentences as being like not literally true, but only like pretend true. But this is a, this is going to be the rare case, at least the way the direction I want to go, in which pretense kind of plays a role in explicating the literal content of, of, of a sentence. But okay, to go back, so what Ken says is he gives what he calls sort of uh, a disavow, or some people have called dis a disavowal account of negative uh, existentials. I get your joke now. Are you saying I was pandering to you in the in the apparent belief that I could be relevant to like today's youth by yeah. mentioning somebody who's already like he's probably like 63 years old by now and so what a pathetic attempt at relevance. I would accept that. <laughs> yeah, is that, that is it? that is sort of the joke. <laughs> <laughs> that is the joke. Good. Okay. Good. Um, well, I guess if I'd done it with Raven Simone, that probably wouldn't have been any, you know, or, or I, I mean, don't know who that is. Yeah. That would be someone else that, yeah. But, but my kids used to watch that. So Raven and, and she was a, she, anyway. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. Well, um, mm. let's see. Okay. Um, so maybe. So I can't achieve genuine relevance because I don't know any, like, I, I don't even know if singing is a, a genre that's currently practiced. So I couldn't really, like, identify. Mumble any. rapping. What's that? P Mumble rap? Mumble rapping. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, people that's rap while perfect. they're mumbling. Well, maybe that was a few years ago. I don't know if that's still really big, but okay. Taylor Swift so maybe, is still singing. Maybe they've moved up to... On to bubble wrapping, which is what I thought you said. Bubble wrapping. An yeah. art form where you sort of snap the bubbles and bubble wrap. But um, mm -hmm. uh, but I can achieve meta relevance by at least being aware of my lack of first level relevance. When I think meta relevance is like super cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah. No, you know you're talking to a philosopher when they start talking about first order and appending appending meta to lots of words oh yeah actually even that's getting old so uh, anyway all right so so what but but kendall walton is this like who's a uh a philosopher for i mean he's, he, he does aesthetics but he does aesthetics in a way that kind of makes it highly relevant to large issues in uh semantics and philosophy of of language. And so his great big book was Mimesis as Make-Believe. It was a theory of the representational arts that assigned a central role to make-believe games and, and, and pretense. Um, anyway, his line in a much unread paper called Existence as Metaphor, question mark, was um, that what's really going on when you say Falstaff doesn't exist is um, um, that you're first sort of putting on display a certain type of attempted referential act. Like when you say Falstaff, you're saying, look at me. He doesn't even want, he's really sort of over fastidious. He doesn't even want to say that he's pretending to use the word Falstaff referentially, because that would be like ridiculous. And he knows it's ridiculous. It's sort of like, he's more like, pretending to attempt to refer. He's not pretending to refer. He's pretending to attempt to refer with the word Falstaff. That's the first thing he's doing when he says Falstaff doesn't exist. And then the rest of the sentence does not exist. He's basically just dissing the thing he just pretended to attempt to do and said, what a joke. I just pretended to attempt to refer with the word Falstaff. That's, ne that's not never going to come off. And so, and so basically it's a two part exercise where you make as if to do something. And then you say that didn't, that didn't work or that can't work. 
And so it is like of a piece with the metalinguistic and other sorts of substitution of a different subject matter kind of approaches that says, well, you're not really talking about false stuff. You're talking about, and then you, you put some sort of spiffy newfangled thing in place of what the intuitive subject matter and, and you um, say that you're criticizing that you're criticizing the name is not referring. You're criticizing the concept as being empty. In his case, you're criticizing the attempted the certain kind of referring attempt as unsuccessful. And so, and then what I say is, you know, you could, you could preserve like all the main features of that view, but make it, get it to do much, you know, you could have a version of that that does much less violence to the semantic phenomenology by saying, well, there is some pretense going on but it's a kind of pretense that that's involved pretty much whenever we say if A then B in indicative mode. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, you caught that I was raising my hand as a question. Um, I, I, I did. I, I, I realize it's going to be something else about Marshall Mathers, but I, I, I'm ready for that. It's not actually about Marshall Mathers. It's about uh, semantic phenomenology. I've never heard those two words coupled together. And oh, when man. you say you, it doesn't do violence to the semantic phenomenology, are you saying that we don't have to go so far as maybe to think that there's some humorous component uh, to what's going oh. on? Okay, so now I, I'm I'm like really even your first year at Stanford. I'm I'm creating all kinds of problems with you <laughs> for you with your professors. Go talk to Mark Crimmins about semantic phenomenology because I think he he may not be the first who uses the, who used the term, but he he makes great use of it in this paper called um, Hesperus and Phosphorus Sense Pretense and Reference, and he um, he talks about it's sort of like you know what it feels like to use something with its standard meaning. And the example he gives was from Bertrand Russell. And Russell says, actually, Russell gives it uh, um, Scott and the author of Waverly. The kids are still reading Waverly, aren't they? No. Right, Sir Walter Scott? Oh, my Definitely God. Definitely not. That was like. We are still well, reading on to noting, though. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. Well, then you're. Heim Gaveman taught a whole course on that at, at Columbia. Oh, is that right? Yeah, well, it was right. supposed to be a class on Russell, but it was all on on denoting. Ah, we still skipped Gray's elegy. <laughs> that was probably a good use of your time. Yeah, <laughs> a good non-use of your time. Yeah. Um. Well, Russell says when you say like Scott is the author of Waverly, it kind of suppose someone. When you said that, said, well, you're just telling me, you're not telling me anything interesting. You're, you're just saying that Scott is Scott. That's boring. I already knew that. You say, no, 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 there's two things. There's Scott, there's the author of Waverly, or to use a better example for this purpose, there's two things. There's Hesperus and there's Phosphorus. Eminem and Marshall. Eminem and Marshall <laughs> uh, uh, Mathers, or, or Prince and the artist formerly known as Prince. I guess I that one, that, that, that's an interesting one because it's sort of like it's not clear there is any information value uh, in that. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so take so take uh, yeah, Eminem and 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 Marshall uh, uh, Mathers, and then there's like. Like Trotsky's real name is like Rosenheim or something. That's somebody else they could use. Leon Trotsky. Yeah. Is that is that fetish with the with the youth today? No, he's Trotsky, not. He's he's not. he's a fringe figure in pop culture these days. Okay. Yeah. Shit. Okay. Um all right. So um anyway, yeah. So you're, you're feeling like here's Hesperus, like the evening star, and here's Phosphorus, the morning star, and they are identical. I mean, it is, it is a, 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 an observation that people have made for a long time, but you got to use the plural when you're kind of telling 
people about like when you're making an informative identity statement, you say they are identical to each other. And so Mark says, and he gets this from, from, from Russell that the phenomenology of informative identity statements is these two things. And you're saying that they are identical to each other. Whereas like officially, there aren't two things if they're identical to each other. I mean, that's just to give you a sense of, you know, or, or I think Frege talks about this as well. Like if I say five plus two is seven, it's supposed to be an identity. They're the very same number. Five plus two is seven. A thing's identical to itself. But in fact, we're tempted to not use is identical to, but to say equals and say, you know, five plus two equals seven. They're these two numbers that are equally large. That's how it feels like you, mm -hmm. you add five to two and you get to the same place as you get to more quickly by get, by saying seven. Anyway, that's an example of semantic phenomenology. Or if you say, you know, what this is an example of Walton's, you know, I'm afraid of the blob when you're watching a horror movie, you know, the blob doesn't exist, but nevertheless, it's what you want to point to as what you're afraid of is what leads you to, you know, shriek when it's sort of like filling up more and more of this uh, uh, screen. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, yeah, that's what semantic phenomenology is. Okay, and, and my raised hand interrupted your explanation of how you would like to not do violence to the semantic phenomenology with your own pretense treatment of non-existence non -existence claims. Yeah, right. So my uh, Gandhian sort of non-violence approach to non-existence claims is that what's really going on when you make, when you say um, Holmes doesn't exist is it does involve, it does make play with a certain pretense to do with Holmes. The pretense is that Holmes exists, but we're able to, to engage in that pretense because we can imagine someone coming to us and giving us um, someone reliable that we're used to taking testimony from and believing it and say, Holmes exists. And then we can take that imagined piece of testimony and work with it and try to figure out, well, what happens next if Holmes exists? And the thought is, when you try to work with that hypothesis, which you can imagine really getting and, and, and believing, um, you run into trouble. You find yourself in bad territory. And that's what I, I want to say it was really going on with uh, non-existence claims. So a simplified form is, of it is, if Holmes exists, then contradiction. And I can say what the contradiction is in, in a second. But the, the, the relation between that form of words, you know, if A, then B, and pretense, really goes back to Ramsey, because Ramsey tells us to evaluate that the standard way, at least of evaluating an indicative conditional is to imagine being informed of the antecedent and kind of tentatively adding that to your stock of beliefs and then working with it and seeing whether the consequent um, is now something you're prepared to accept. So if I'm, if I'm told, uh, uh, if there's someone in the next room, it's Judy. Um, I'm told um, that uh, the right next move to make, so to speak, after taking on the hypothesis that there's someone in the next room is that the person in the next room is, is Judy. That isn't to say I should really think Judy's in the next room. It's sort of like how to say in categorical terms what I'm to think. It's, it's, it's really not obvious. It's not clear a categorical claim is being made. Rather, 
maybe a certain inferential disposition is being sort of urged on me. Uh, should you come to think there's someone in the next room, th think that it's Judy. And there may be sort of facts that make that a good inferential disposition, like um, Judy is the person who always hides in the next room. But that's not what's being said. It's sort of just sort of what sort of explains the propriety of that inferential disposition and the propriety maybe of the indicative conditional that go, goes with it. And so the, the thought with, with Holmes is um, basically the reason it's, o it's okay to say that Holmes doesn't exist is what you're really being told is um, if Holmes exists, then falsehood, where the ultimate falsehood is the, the absurd. And the reason, the yeah. way you get to that result is, and I can work up to it in stages, but I could see an involuntary intake of breath characteristic of somebody who can't believe what the fuck he's being told. So <laughs> I should let you say something. No, no, no. That was a, you, you miss, you misconstrued my involuntary. Okay. Well, try, uh, try not to, try not a, to yes. breathe because it's really distracting me. No, just like, Am I breathing into the microphone? You're, you're apparently breathing or something. Okay. There's something I'll going breathing. on. I'll there. breathe to the side. Like, but it was actually an excited intake of breath. Keep going. Oh, oh okay. All right. I hear the absurd and I, I get excited. You, uh, you, hear the, you hear the absurd? Okay. Well, you came to the right place. Um, so so Kripke gives this example um, of... Um, somebody raising the hypothesis. Someone might, might tell you, God, I just got word. Holmes is in this room right now. Is one of us in this room. And you say, well, that at least I can, I can be sure is wrong. Cause if Holmes was in this room, then he'd be, well, well right now, uh, I'm the only one in, 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 in this room. Actually, when you start studying Ken Walton's work, which you, You've got, this afternoon going, now. Yeah, this afternoon. One of his views is that I'm actually um, not just seeing an image of you right now, but I'm seeing you. And maybe in some broad sense, we're both yeah. in an extended room. And so you're in the room too. But I'm not going to, I don't accept that view of Ken Sungus. I'm the only one in this room right now. And so philosophy of Zoom. Yeah, philosophy of Zoom. Yeah. Um, so. For me to contemplate the, the possibility of Holmes being in this room is for me to contemplate the possibility that Holmes is me. But I'm pretty darn sure that Holmes isn't me for the same reason I'm kind of reason I'm pretty sure that King of France isn't isn't me. I mean, there's all sorts of things that disqualify me from the role of King of France. And what Kripke says is, well, look, I was born too late. Like Holmes was like born in the 19th. If Holmes exists, he was born in the 19th century. Well, I certainly wasn't born in the 19th century, although the dated character of some of my references might make that sort of like... At a, least the 19th hypothesis. century. Yeah. <laughs> the 19th century. Right. No, I said the 19th century. That's when, that's when he oh, I, okay. would, would have been born. Yeah. But, but I was born in the 20th century. You'll be interested to know. Um, so... So um, I'm pretty sure that if Holmes doesn't exist, if Holmes exists, he's not in this room. And I could even go bigger on this and say, well, if Holmes exists, he's not in this house or he's not in Cambridge, Massachusetts right now. There's only so many people in Cambridge. And I'm pretty darn sure that if I go through a list of them, I'll get if Holmes exists, he's that person. That's going to be false, too, for you know, specific reasons I could give. Well, they were all born too late as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, for everything in the universe, if Holmes exists, he's that thing. There's good and specific reasons why that's false. I would like to see you verify it, though. I, <laughs> I'm willing to do that. Actually, I did that in a in a, uh, a longer uh, uh, uh uh, PowerPoint document. Well, it's actually a Mathematica spreadsheet 
script that you'd have to run. So you, are you an expert in Mathematica? I didn't think no. so. So you'll have to take my word for it. Okay. That I it's, will. it's I will. all worked out. Yeah. It's like a computer proof where you kind of have to take the, you know, it's like the four, you believe the four color theorem, right? Even though you oh, yes, I do believe like it. Proof by cases. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's like that. This is a very long proof by cases. And, you know, you have to, you'd have to go and, and, and check the script, but just take my word for it. There's good, good reasons why everything in the universe is such that it's not the case that if Holmes exists, he's that thing. But on the other hand, if Holmes exists, he has to be one of the things in the universe. So that's the what I, that's the contradiction. If Holmes yeah. exists, he's one of the things in the universe. But for everything in the universe, if Holmes exists, he's not that thing. Right. Yeah. That's itself not quite a contradiction because of the scope yeah. variation. But anyway, I've, but it, I brought you close enough. I mean, if you yeah. if you can't wrap it up, then you know. No, it's wrapped. I don't know what to, to you know to think. Yeah. I like it. To, I I do have one last question that's only uh, tangentially related uh, to fictional and non-existent objects, but. I'm curious uh, if you have a particular view on the status of mathematical objects. Are you curious or are you emulating curiousness for purposes of, for discussion purposes? To trap you or something? No, no I'm, 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 I'm genuinely curious about if you have a position. Yeah. Um, I, to, insofar as I have a position, and this might be like, if Holmes exists, then blah. But if I have a position, it's that um, there's no fact of the matter as to the existence of typical mathematical objects. And the reason roughly is that... Um, all we have to sort of go on in <clears throat> judging whether mathematical objects exist is to look at the sentences that make play with them and asking what role those objects would, uh, with, what contribution those objects would make to the felt truth value of those sentences. And I want to say that mathematical objects are the rare kind of object whose job description is itself enough for you to decide the truth value of the sentences that's, that might seem to argue for their existence. So if I say like, God exists, I think there's a fact of the matter whether that's true, because I can't tell you, when I look at all the sentences involving God, like God made the world and so on, uh, uh, I can't tell you whether they're true just on the basis of what God is supposed to be like. Um, like, I can't tell you, for instance, whether sort of God is responsible for the difference between good and evil, you know, like whether a divine command theory of good and evil is true. But for most sentences involving mathematical objects, well, not... Again, there's a Mathematica spreadsheet on this. I can tell you, I do it in the spreadsheet. I'll like request whether that. Whether a mathematical statement recording. is true. Yeah. On the basis of the job description. In other words, it's not as though I'm looking to genuine mathematical objects really out there in the universe to um, decide the truth values of statements that their job description doesn't decide. In fact, if they started to do that, I'd be worried. So a better example for this purpose is, is the kind of mathematical object that um, used to study um, in my one year in logic and methodology at Berkeley, namely a model, a model of say a first order sentence. So people say this was sort of Tarski's analysis of v validity. Um, um, you know, an argument is valid if every model of its premises is a model of its conclusion. 
Um, and that's a very attractive theory of validity. But here's what you don't want to have happen, that over and above your idea of what models would have to be like if they existed, there's a further fact which models in fact do exist. And it's it's the line between the models that happen to exist and the ones that don't happen to exist that really decides which arguments are valid. So in other words, we're not, to use a phrase from Crispin Wright, in the market for the discovery that certain arguments are valid that don't look valid because what seem to us like they ought to be counter models to them, models of the premises that falsify the conclusion, hap don't, you know, happen not to really exist. In other words, the notion of model that we're working with when we give that analysis is models as they're supposed to be, things that answer to our picture of what models are supposed to be like, not the models that we, in other words, Platonists often say that you really need the mathematical objects to be out there to pick up the slack, maybe, between our conception of what they're supposed to be like and what's really going on. They're there to sort of stiffen the discourse's spine by really deciding in the way only an external domain of fact can, uh, which of these sentences are going to be true or not. And I want to say in the case of mathematical objects, we precisely don't want them to be playing that role because that's to be saying that there's like deeply practiced transcendent determinants of mathematical truth. And so we'd say, oh yeah, the continuum hypothesis is true or it's false, or this argument is valid or it isn't valid in a way that people will never be in a position to judge that's decided by the contents of Plato's heaven or something. And so the only way to save the integrity of certain kind of seemingly platonic object involving practices from being sort of uh, shaped from above by things that we don't really have access to is to say, well, we're really talking about the intent, you know, mathematical objects as intentional objects or as things that answer to our conception, you know, of what those objects would have to be like. So just as some people sometimes object to David Lewis's theory of like possible worlds as the grounds of modal truth, that, you know, it sort of seems possible that I could have been an inch taller. But if Lewis is right, and there is no concrete world where I'm an inch taller, that one just happens to be missing, then it's not really possible for me to have been an inch taller. Well, in the same way, we don't want to say that um, Goldbach's conjecture that every, every even number is the sum of two primes is true, not because there isn't a thinkable even number, did I say even number or real number by mistake? Not because there isn't a thinkable even number uh, that isn't the sum of two primes, but because that one has to, happens to be missing. It isn't really out there. So Goldbach's conjecture got lucky. We don't want to say that, but we have to say that if we let arithmetical truth um, you know, cling desperately to the actual array of platonic objects out there. So therefore we shouldn't let it do that. So I want to say there's no fact of the matter. Roughly, there's no fact of the matter whether a certain kind of object exists. If the truth value determining properties it would have can be played just as well, as well by what we ask of that, of that object. Yeah. Well, that was, that was all really helpful and informative. I think we've been sufficiently uh, metaphilosophical and indeed even uh, metahumorous in this conversation to merit talking a bit about jokes. So I, I gather that humor, just from talking to you, uh, humor is a pretty integral part of your uh, personality. So 
I'm guessing that this answer is going to be quite simple, but what made you first consider thinking about philosophy and jokes? I actually don't remember. I mean, um, I guess, I guess I'd always be struck by how certain aspects of philosophy are, are funny. I mean, people often remark that, you know, this or that passage in, in uh, Wittgenstein or, or, you know, why, why can't a dog lie? Is it because he's too honest? That the, the kind of thing can, can be, a bit funny and actually almost nothing is funnier than the philosophers that have written about humor attempts to explain where it comes from. You know, it's like, explaining a joke is, is supposed to be like a, a great way of, of ruining a joke, but yeah, certain explanations of what jokes are seem like they'll, you know, you'll never laugh again after you, you, you hear them because, it, you know, but um, I don't actually, you know, I, th I, I suspect I was just like trying to find some way to just distract myself. I mean, people have written much more ably about philosophy and humor than I am. I, in fact, it was just sort of like recreational. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there isn't that much writing about philosophy and humor out there so why or, or do you have an opinion on why philosophers typically haven't thought much about jokes either as a philosophical subject or even i mean as far as i'm aware i mean so quine was very funny but but humor isn't typically used as much of a methodological tool i mean we've been talking about we've been talking about david lewis a fair bit today and argle and bargle i mean that's a very comedic paper and it's one that's yeah. endured for a very long time but it's not and i mean today with philosophy's professionalization and papers looking more and more uh, scientific and dry it seems like humor is being sort of sapped out of philosophy as opposed to being pumped into it yeah um well, I mean, I should just sort of give a shout out to the, the people that have been writing about humor. I just saw actually a paper. I haven't read it yet. Someone's giving it somewhere. Well, I had Lavelle was... Anderson of, of Syracuse on the podcast to talk about humor. A oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, Is it Robin? Maybe Robin Dembroff has a paper called "Humor as Counter Speech" or something. Uh, maybe that's more about the political aspects of of humor. Um, but you know, Ted Cohen, um, um, Terry Eagleton, who's like a Marxist literary theorist. Uh, I'm not sure he's a Marxist. Any? I'm not sure he's alive anymore. But he has a he has a very good book about humor it's it's a uh, epigraph joke is is um people used to laugh when i told them i wanted to be a comedian well i can tell you nobody's laughing now mm -hmm. yeah. classic <laughs> yeah it's a classic um marshall mathers like that one by the way mm. it goes way back um the um dan dennett has uh a good book with i can't remember who it's co-authored with called In inside jokes that hmm. influence he's got a lot of books it's hard to keep track yeah it's true yeah um but um i don't know i mean i thought i sometimes notice that at talks that some colleagues of mine sometimes like get a long face when there's a New Yorker cartoon where a guy goes up to a horse and says, why the long face? 
Cause, another classic. Cause, cause, yeah, anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, but some, some, sometimes colleagues of mine get a long, long face when people get humorous and talks. And I think it's cause it's perceived as kind of distracting and a way kind of, of, getting people to not focus on like the details of the argument and trying to kind of win yourself a break by just sort of getting, yeah, you know, what well, if I can't I, convince you, at least I can earn your goodwill. What? I think that is one of Graham's um, quitis- criticisms of Quine. I was going to say quitis- criticisms oh, because criticisms. Quine, yeah. uh, but uh, he has I mean, he thinks of Quine as such a good stylist that, it makes up for in the paper on what there is, it makes up for what on his view is a very poor and deceiving argument. Oh, I see. That's interesting. Makes up for in the sense is like a lame attempt to compensate for. Yeah. And it's distracting. I mean, the sort of sense that you just indicated. Yeah. So I've been, I've been trying just, you know, cause I'm getting on and I've got nothing to do to amuse myself uh, you know, to 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 start almost every talk with 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 the joke, and oftentimes lately, I mean, I've been running into the the problem that well, you don't want you don't want the joke to be too funny because it really is is distracting. So, but I saw an opening here because a lot of my jokes aren't overly funny. So then I. I <laughs> I explained to people in advance that I, I've been working really hard on trying to find jokes that aren't distractingly funny and I want their feedback and whether I, you know, I, I succeeded and then I'll tell the joke and later people will say, you know, that joke was not very funny. And I'll go, yes, that's exactly, you know, that's a sweet spot that I'm, I'm going for a lot of the time. A joke it's a good excuse. Funny. You could just tell that it was supposed to be funny, but that's, that's it. Um, and um, so I do think a lot of the time, yeah, like the the dialectical purpose of a joke does really doesn't doesn't require it to be very funny, which is which is which is good because the last thing you want to do is sort of like set yourself up as a, a funny man and then make everybody groan. Hmm. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, but the reason, like, I, another thing I notice is that there can sometimes be a kind of an analogy between jokes and philosophical comments that, like, so, so here's here, here's one that, so Kant has this analogy he gives. Um, which I've always really liked, which is, um, well, he, he asks us to consider the dove who's trying to make its way through the air by flapping its wings and it resents the atmosphere for kind of slowing it down by creating this sort of friction. It says, you know, if there was just no air here, I, I really could get somewhere. Um, and you know, and you're supposed to think, well, that is like a really foolish kind of indignation because if there was no atmosphere, you couldn't get anywhere, you know? And Kant seems to be suggesting that you know, this kind of ingratitude for the constraints that were, un- that are, that were under in our cognitive lives, mm-hmm. failure to realize that those are the constraints that let us achieve any altitude at all. Mm-hmm. Um, is characteristic of how philosophers sometimes think about things. But there's a there's a a, a, a kind of a Yiddish joke that that reminded me of uh, just like the the people the citizens of Chelm, Polish town of Chelm, are supposed to have cursed the Almighty for giving them the sun in the daytime when it was light out anyway, and they didn't need it, rather than at night when it was dark and they really could use some sunlight. And it does seem somewhat characteristic of philosophy to rail at things without which 
the, the phenomenon under study, you know, like the philosophers to rail, rail at like the way emotions sort of come into moral thinking or the way we are more partial to those around us as though, you know, a more enlightened morality would just abstract away from feelings or what we care about and so on. Um, and anyway, I'm, there's, 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 there's this, you know, Wittgenstein has this sort of very unkantian analogy. He says the philosopher's job is to show the fly the way out of the fly bottle. There the, 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 the fly bottle really is getting in the way. The, 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 the fly kind of, the bottle deserves the flies. The fly bottle is something that used to be used in Marshall Mather days to <laughs> uh, keep, I don't know, actually, it was even before my time. <laughs> you try to trap flies and fly bottles. 18th century. 18th century or something like that. Uh, 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 so that, you know, the fly, you know, should be pissed off at the bottle. It really is sort of get getting in its way. And I say somewhere that, you know, a lot, a lot of philosophy is like trying to distinguish whether the thing you're pissed off about is like the dove being stupidly infuriated at the air for like slowing it down or the fly being properly infuriated at the bottle for keeping it in. And I think we look around at the various constraints we operate under and it's just very hard to tell which of them are actually making the operation possible in the first place and which of them are actually getting in the way. And there's a lot of, you know, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. My grandfather is in a perennial war with the moles in his backyard and then the oh, yeah. deer that eat his flowers. And I tend to think of, he, he always refers to them as obnoxious, which I think of as like those obnoxious moles, those obnoxious deer, which I think of as a category mistake. Uh, but I don't know if, if, if that's the sort of predicate that can apply to such creatures, but yeah. I tend to think of him as railing more against the atmosphere than the fly bottle. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so maybe we'll I get back to clear. Kant though, who yeah. is clearly well known as among the funniest philosophers of all time, which is what makes reading him such a joy. Kant. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, but uh, bef before we get back to Kant, my understanding is that there are, a few theories of humor that you refer to. And one of them is the superiority theory, uh, which I take is somewhat connected to what's now uh, maybe colloquially referred to as uh, punching down. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of a way of, yeah, superiority theory, which I think maybe Hobbes had this theory. It's sort of a way of like taking pleasure in this some huge advantage you have over your interlocutor uh, by, say, being one step ahead of them or by saying something ambiguous and like tending them into the wrong interpretation. And just, you know... Um, I guess was this Hobbes who has this expression uh, that sort of you you laugh out of a sense of I think he calls it sudden glory. You sort of take glory and pride, and you're like advantage over your whoever you're 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 talking to. So I guess it yeah. I never knew quite what punching down meant, but that that. That seems like it, that could be. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what it is. But then this leads, I mean, I mean, this doesn't seem to account for all humorous phenomena or, or jokes. And I think it leads into something called uh, the incongruity theory. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, a lot. So a lot of a lot of a lot of humor is kind of laughing at your own 
mistakes or your own weaknesses and uh, the way you manage to get sort of tangled up in your own thinking. Um, and yeah, and the incongruity theory, I really should have checked. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm not going to get it right, but the incongruity theory sort of says kind of we laugh at the juxtaposition of things that don't really go together, but sort of our form of life or maybe the joke itself sort of pushes them into proximity. And so you have to consider them <coughs> together. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's an example of something that's not, I mean, the way I just put it anyway, it's like laughable and it's ridiculous and that, you know, you, you know, just just juxtaposing kind of things that don't go together isn't itself automatically funny or people will be laughing at what I'm wearing every day. Well, actually, that's a true prediction of the theory. But, um, but I mean, just generally, juxtapositions, just juxtaposing things that don't go together is not, is not intrinsically uh, funny, but, but I guess what, what I like, what I like about the incongruity theory is that it sort of leaves room for the possibility of laughing at yourself. And, um, and uh, it seems like, the fact that there's so many kind of dweeby Jewish comedians whose only route to popularity is like making people laugh suggests that um, <laughs> it can't really, it can't really be a matter of lording it over people. It's rather more getting, getting the, 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 uh, the really superior people to not to, beat you up less often because you can amuse them. Mm -hmm. That was, that was kind of my childhood route to whatever, whatever funniness I was able to, to muster. Yeah. Yeah. I was just listening to a, a podcast where they were talking about Chris rock and how growing up in Brooklyn, that was, I think it was Brooklyn. Maybe it was somewhere else, but how he, uh, sort of avoided bullies by being the funny kid. Yeah. It's not just that we be Until Jewish he met Will Smith. Mm -hmm. Until he met Will Smith. I hear his latest, did you watch his latest special? No. Okay. I heard it was, I heard it was like a little bit over the top or something. I mean, it's, yeah. no, I, I haven't yeah. seen it yet either, but Okay, so we've got the superiority theory. We've got the incongruity theory. I guess Kant was... Well, was he t speaking about jokes? or Because I don't get the sense that he would be writing about humor. But I guess he did... I guess the subject matter was kind of absurd and maybe absurdity is connected to humor. Yeah, well, he talks about... He actually does talk a little bit about jokes. Okay. In fact, there's I think there's this book called not exactly the it's called Kant's Humorous Writings. I don't know if that if that title is itself supposed. That sounds to be. like it doesn't refer. <laughs> yeah, or 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 or, or, or it could be my like my so called life. You know, it's like uh, mm -hmm. uh, all his writings are are humorous in their pretentiousness or something like that. Hobbes, Hobbes talks about who's like, like a lot of, a lot of older philosophers. I mean, a lot of, a lot of philosophers going back to sort of Plato and Aristotle. Hobbes is kind of down on humor. And he, 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 he talks about those grimaces called, called laughter. And um, whereas Kant, um, wants to explain what it is that excites a lively convulsive laugh, which is at least closer. I mean, you know, if it's a convulsive laugh, it's not just like 
chuckling into your handkerchief at a faculty dinner. It's like, you know, something that really, you know, gave you some, some pleasure. He can't actually does tell three jokes in his work. Hmm. He has three different jokes and they're like totally not funny, <laughs> but, um, I remember two of them, but, um, but, but here, here's what he said. Here's what he says. And I find this like somewhat perceptive, although I don't, he says there must be something absurd in which the understanding therefore can find no satisfaction. Laughter is an affection arising from the sudden transformation of a strained expectation into nothing. In other words, you're expecting something to make a certain kind of sense and then poof, it, it vanishes. This transformation, which is certainly not enjoyable to the understanding, the understanding is a kind of, you know, very, very demanding as far as like it wants to be given sort of cog cogitation worth, worthy material, yet it indirectly gives it very active enjoyment for a moment. So he says the cause of the lively convulsive laughter is the influence of the representation upon the body and the reflex effect of this upon the mind. So it's sort of like we, we, we make fools of ourselves trying to make sense of something that doesn't really like, you can't really make sense of. And then we catch ourselves in the act and that's kind of funny. It's a little bit like catching sight of yourself it's like an intellectual analog of catching sight of yourself in a showroom window, like tripping on the pavement or something like that. It says, I can't believe I was trying. It's like, you know, there's this, there's examples people sometimes give of like sentences that seem grammatical, but really aren't. Or maybe they are grammatical, but you can't really make sense of them. And when you try to process them and you don't really succeed, it's hard not to chuckle. So the one standard example is, uh, I should say one, this is the only one I know of, is like someone says, can we used to give this as an argument for the autonomy of syntax, that this sort of passes all your syntax tests, but when semantics gets to it, it can't do anything with it. But mm -hmm. the example is, more people have been to Germany than I have. <laughs> yeah, that is, I like that sentence. It sort of it sort of feels like it should make sense, and you keep on like working it over, trying to anyway. But so then you, and sort of kind of when you realize that you can't, it's kind of like, what a fool am I? It's like, and that's that's one connection that I I kind of see between jokes and philosophy that they're both kind of they both have a. I can't remember who who's whose response who says this Shakespeare line about like Lord, what fools these mortals be? The angels or somebody is looking down. You know, people do things that make the angels laugh, and 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 uh, they just sort of like trip over their own feet, both you know, in the sort of slapstick physical way, and also, but also. In, in, in cognitive ways, and I, I think I think philosophy, or the funny parts of philosophy, involve sort of catching ourselves in the act of tripping our over our own feet. Yeah, it's funny. More people have been to Germany than I have. I feel like as I, uh, I mean, I speak so much on these podcasts. Hopefully, I speak less than my guests, but it's a constant you try battle. To make sure that, but yeah. It's a constant battle not to have all of my sentences be semantically impenetrable in this sort of way <laughs> as they drag on and on. But hold on, was what was the quote you read from Kant supposed to be a joke? Because I hope his other jokes are funnier if that was supposed to be one of them. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be a joke. Okay. That was, that, that I'm, was I'm like, relieved to hear trying that. to figure out why you laugh. And he says... Okay. It's like you try to make sense of something absurd. Yeah. You can't. There's some kind of reef. The, you're not being able to make sense of it somehow, like does something to your body, which then bounces back to your mind. And, you, and then you think, oh, my God, what was I just doing? Right. I what thought that perhaps, it? though, that was supposed to be in the 
take the form of a joke. Do you remember what any of his actual jokes? I, I got a couple of them here. Uh, where is it? Oops. Okay, well, they're so bad. Um, <laughs> I expect nothing less. Okay. You were interrupting again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, so one of them was like some, you know, somebody, a bald person on a ship. The ship was about was 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 rocking and seemed like it was about to go down. And the person was so afraid that their wig turned white. That's one of Kant's jokes. That is funny. I'm laughing. I'm more laughing because of your expression. But no, yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not. We can talk. It's about absurd, that, it's though. Not. I and that's interesting. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. You know, the, the phenomenon of explaining, like, why a joke is funny, that's, that, that isn't really, you know, it's not recommended. But I am willing to explain to you later, if you have time, why certain parent jokes aren't funny. Certain parent jokes? A, pa a parent jokes. Okay. No, I, well, dad jokes. first, can we hear another con joke and then explain? Yeah, okay. Me. So there, there's a... Uh, this might also have been on a ship. Somebody's like, um, he likes the oh, ships. I, I guess. Yeah. Uh, somebody's opens a bottle of beer that was like, had been jostled around too much. And the beer spills all over the table, you know, like the suds just like pour out of the top of the bottle. And, and, um, as it decompresses and the person who, who was going to get the beer kind of laughs and they're asked why. And they say, well, something like, I'm not so amazed that at how it all came out that way. I'm just more amazed at how they got it in in the first place, given how 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 big it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the wig one was funnier. Really? <laughs> yeah, that's one for the ages. The scholars will be pondering that for a long time. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a kid, I saw this Jonathan Winters sketch where it was it was, it was comedy for kids actually, and and uh, he had this one thing where he was trying to explain how they got the toothpaste in the tube. Given that there's like miles of toothpaste in a tube. He said, so like originally it's all laid out in this like mile long trough. And then people put the, the tube in a, in a device that sort of holds it with the top open. And then a bunch of people kind of hold on to the trough and run at the tube like full <laughs> speed until they jam it all the way in and then someone has to like put the top on really 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 quick that's a nice image i do wonder and i'm sure that a cursory google search would answer this for me though i don't want to ruin the mystery but how it is that the stripe when you get like a nice striped toothpaste yeah. is always like centered because like how does that work in the jar in the yeah. in the tube very i like to yeah. think of it as just a miracle so this actually or i wonder wonder whether you think this confirms your judgment that your suggestion earlier that there can be a philosophy that every question repays philosophical hmm. investigation it is, it is you know well i actually don't think that okay uh, I was just saying that no, um, and I don't. I don't think I have a, a good answer why either. I mean, I I think anything can be an example for philosophical fodder. So I mean, if yeah. you're if you're writing about the philosophy of holes, uh, Swiss cheese is going to be yeah. uh, a great example. But I'm not sure what uh, the philosophy of cheese is unless you're going to really yeah. deflate the term philosophy. There probably there probably is stuff out there about the philosophy 
the, well, there's certainly, I mean, ele- I mean, you could talk about cheese from a, a qualia standpoint, a, 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 a whole standpoint. Yeah. Uh, you might, I mean, there's certainly a creed of the cheese mongers. Uh, some people take their cheese monging uh, or mongering very seriously. Oh, yeah. yeah. So what's, what's the difference between a paradox monger and a cheese monger? Seems like there could be some interesting. Do you have mm-hmm. a joke here? Is this one that I'm supposed no, to think of an no, answer for? No, no, no. It's just Russell. Russell talks about paradox mongering and like how that's not a good way to do philosophy, just to sort of throw a bunch of paradoxes out there. So I would like to know more about. Actually, there were. I guess the the thing that was slightly wasn't a joke, but there there are. You, you, one's used to thinking of words as like having infinite combinatorial powers. Like you, you know, you can ask Chomsky about this when, when you interview him uh, next week. You know, like words combine ever so many ways with 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 other words. But there are a few. There are some words that like have very limited sort of distributional powers, and monger is one. Like there's a like paradox monger, cheese monger. There's this there's this Irish humorist that I love. This guy named Flann O'Brien who used to write this column in the Irish Times, and one of his uh, one of his favorite categories was he had this thing he called the cataclysm of cliche, in which he sort of went. He had these long lists of words that could only be used in exactly like three ways. So he says, and, 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 and he, it's, it's, he, he called it a catechism because it's kind of like catechism in church where there's a prescribed question answer kind of uh, pairs. But he says, what can be meted out? He says, punishment can be meted out. What can be meted out besides punishment? And I think the only other two things are There's treatment. a great Tennyson poem. Uh, Ulysses. Oh, okay. Where Tennyson meet? Let's see. Uh, Ulysses. It, little prophets that an idle king by this still hearth among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race. So I and guess meet- you can meet unequal laws unto a savage race. Okay, that's great. I like that. Yeah. The so good poem. He should have. Yeah. You think he was like a very learned guy. Yeah. Uh, he but, was. but you meet. Yeah. Hmm. Dole is. Yeah. I mean, it, meet is kind of like dole. It also has a dole also has sort of a somewhat, you know, you can dole out favors or you can Bob dole. But there's Bob dole. There's hmm. like the whole dole pineapple thing um but but he said the only other things that the only other things that this particular guy could think of were treatment and consideration you can mean a punishment treatment and consideration but now unequal laws upon a savage race still that's only four that's pretty limited Mm -hmm. okay i'm gonna finish with two questions one what you were going to say something about apparent jokes and why they're not funny. No, I wasn't really. I was just going to, I was, I was just uh, humorously alluding. That was the superiority theory of humor. I was suggesting that you were credulously laughing at stuff that wasn't really funny. Okay. Joke acknowledged. Um, and I'm sorry for my Have your guard up, man. Yeah, have my guard up. Okay, and then my last question. So I am unsure whether you have or have had, or this is some alternate Steve Yablo, uh, a thriving music career. And I can't tell in particular if there's a, a Yablo Sprite commercial that I saw on your website. I can't tell if that's you or what that is, uh, but I encourage anybody who's, curious about the legend of somebody named Diablo to check out this uh, commercial on your website. 
Okay. Yeah. Then they can, I'm, we're, it's an active research area. Uh, people are trying to. Is that you? Out. I'm, I'm not going to make your job that easy. It's like, okay. You know, the, yeah. Is it me? Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I will, um, anybody who determines whether this is Steve Diablo, uh, please, uh, drop me a line. Uh, okay. but anyway, uh, Steve, this has been really fun. It's been very meta philosophical and, and meta humorous. So thanks so much for talking with me. Thanks so much. It was great. Robinson. Appreciate it. Hold on. Geeslings before you go, please, uh, like subscribe, follow. If you haven't already smash all those buttons and also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not <laughs> joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so.